like I said, welcome again, Showcase 2022. As people are joining, remember we're on Zoom, so try to have some Zoom etiquette. Keep your cameras on if you like, but your your microphones muted and stay tuned because we are looking forward to 60 minutes of fun with the current cohort participants. I'm going to share my screen. This is the presentation we have today, and it's just based around, like we said, welcome to Showcase 2022. The agenda today, obviously, I'm going to introduce C2M and myself. We're going to have Eric from Blackfoot also introduce himself. Then we're going to do a roundtable discussion with the cohort participants, pitching each of their awesome ideas today. We'll do a little Q&A if we have time. And then finally, we're going to wrap up and talk about next steps. So here we are. As we said, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Andrew Schultz with the Insight Studio and C2M Beta. I've been the community manager for over two years now and helping architect and spearhead the delivery of this great content for the last four years plus with Blackfoot as our main financial sponsor and contributor to create this incredible outcome for all these business owners in the area. So why are we here, right? Montana has insanely deep roots in entrepreneurship. And we know that I think it's a 60 plus percent of Montana business owners are entrepreneurs. Um, and entrepreneurship is just a strong thread that not only runs through the state of Montana, but Blackfoot as a co-op being owned by its participants and even through myself running a small business and working in small businesses, helping other small businesses grow. So I'm very excited to be here today. I'm excited to present the current cohort participants and to see what their great business ideas are. And I'm excited for each of you today to lean in, listen, come up with great questions and reach out to me after this presentation to say, hey, I'd love to chat with person X or person Y or tell me more about C2M or even potentially, hey, I would love to join this presentation or join this this process as a mentor or as a participant. So welcome to C2M Beta Showcase 2022 again. I'm Andrew Schultz, and now I'm going to kick it off to Eric with Blackfoot. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Eric Mitling, and I'm the Consumer Business Manager at Blackfoot Communications. And like Andrew said, yeah, I just want to welcome everybody to the 2022 C2M Beta Fall Slash Winter Showcase event. Uh, th th thanks a lot for, for taking the time to, to join us for this program. Uh, th this is the culmination of 12 weeks of really focused and intense work for a lot of these entrepreneurs where, um, sorry, uh, where they've uh, really focused uh, on refining and validating their ideas. Um, and it's just been, been awesome to watch. So, but, you know, at Blackfoot, we've been doing this program, supporting this program for, for several years now. Um, we've really been able to follow along in the journeys of a variety of different businesses ranging from blockchain technology, to telemedicine, e-commerce, agribusiness, and I mean, pretty much everything in between, right? So it's been a really fun and exciting program to be involved in. And um, I guess personally, I'm just really grateful to be a very small part of that through my role here at Blackfoot. So um, quick note about Blackfoot, I guess, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with who we are, uh, Blackfoot is a member-owned cooperative based here in Missoula. We're one of Montana's largest independent broadband providers, and we connect homes and businesses to reliable communication services such as high-speed fiber-based internet uh, throughout our rural communities in Montana and Idaho, uh, all the way up to providing enterprise-grade managed network services to large publicly traded companies uh, with locations across, across the, the nation. So, um, but again, you know, as a cooperative, supporting the communities that we serve is it's just a part of everything that we do. And, uh, you know, one of the many ways that we support our communities is just through this C2M beta program. Um, it really is a great program. We, we love supporting it, being involved in. Um, and we, again, we believe it just delivers tremendous value to those communities. Um, one quick plug or, or announcement I want to make really quick is um, that over the past few months, we've, we've been working internally and with Andrew um, to develop another resource for small businesses. Uh, next week on December 21st, we're making available a free online course for small business owners and operators. To start, this course uh, has four sessions that include some foundational information and tools for entrepreneurs that they can leverage really just, I guess, at any stage of growth, wherever you're at in your business. Um, it includes topics on sales, marketing, finance, operations. Um, so we, we hope it'll be useful. Um, additionally, as part of that, we're, we're going to take a stab at hosting some office hours on a monthly basis where participants can dial in, ask questions, and we'll, we'll try our best to answer those. And if we can't, uh, again, that's part of the community, right? We'll, we'll reach out and try to connect you with a resource that can help you answer that question. 
Um, so again, it's a free course. It's available to anyone. Uh, we'd love it if you'd sign up, if you'd share it, uh, give us feedback uh, on just what you think about it, if it's adding value or what we could do to improve it. Um, so right now you can sign up by going to goblackfoot.com slash small business toolkit. Again, that's goblackfoot.com slash small business toolkit. And uh, once you sign up for that, you'll start receiving content next week uh, when we go live. So um, I guess just kind of closing out, um, I really want to thank all the cohort members for letting us uh, be just a part of your journey. Um, again, I, I was able to be involved early on, um, you know, in, in one of the, the sessions, and it was just really interesting to see just kind of how those you know presentations were going. And I'm just very excited to see how how kind of the the sort of finished product is after this 12 week course. So very excited to see uh, you know how everybody um, sort of has evolved and changed and validated their ideas and refined their ideas. So um, again, thanks for letting us be just a part of that journey. Um, also, a huge thank goes out. Thanks goes out to all the mentors who took time out of their busy schedules to be a part of this and to help the cohort members. Um, again, just another amazing part about this program is is the, the mentors that were were able to connect. Um, and finally, uh, Andrew, just want to thank you over at the Insight Studio for your time and for being being that conduit, amazing conduit for helping these entrepreneurs build those meaningful relationships and connecting with those mentors. Um, so again, just yeah, thanks thanks a lot to, to everybody for for all the work you've done in in making this program a success. So um, I guess just sit back, listen to these great presentations, and I guess I would encourage any of you to engage with these entrepreneurs if you have any interest, if you have any expertise, or you have your own unique community that you can you know leverage, I guess, to help any of these folks accelerate their ideas. Because that's that's that is really what this is all about, right? That connecting to more that C two M, that C two M beta. Um, so, um, again, engage, uh, we'd appreciate it. Connect with folks. Um, so again, yeah, thanks again for joining us and I'm going to hand it back to Andrew to get this thing rolling. That's awesome. Eric, thank you so much for the introduction. And as he said, I chatted a link to the small business toolkit, sign up, check it out, sign up. You might find some resources. If you've been through C2M, you might've seen them before. And we really hope it helps business owners throughout the Northwest really thrive and take that next step so we can help connect you to more, like you said. With that, before we go into the future, just a quick look into the past by the numbers. C2M founded in 2018. I love it over a beer at a local brewery, really discussing ways to help the community and C2M Connect to More was born. We've had now with the graduation of these six cohort participants, 26 companies over six sessions, hundreds of Zoom hours, thousands of connections, and hopefully millions of dollars made for C2M businesses helping these communities that they grow in. With that team, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm going to grab the first cohort participant, Spencer Bradford. Are you ready? Are you ready to knock these things out and kick this, kick this thing and get it going? I think you are. <laughs> Spencer Bradford, our first cohort participant, is going to kick it off and lead us into the beginning of Showcase 2022. And I have a, I'll share my screen first before he does. I have a great photo that I found of him online um, and he's representing Fishhawk and I'll let him talk more about it, but I just love this photo. So I did want to share that. Um, and with that, Spencer, I'll let you take it away. Mm -hmm. How's everybody doing? Doing great. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm excited to be here. I want to say thanks to everybody who uh, was part of my cohort and Andrew. This is super exciting. Um, I've been in Montana for about 30 years and I'm going to share a gem of a business idea I learned about about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and as the world has shifted and um, uh, things are changing every day, uh, I think that this idea it's time is now, and I'm excited to share it with everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? Mm -hmm. And yep. see my yep. screen. We can sure hear you. Okay. Are you seeing me or are you seeing my presentation? Still seeing you. No presentation yet. Okay, great. Well, let me, uh, this is always the fun part. Um, is uh, making sure that the, that it shows. It's 
Spencer, we could also jump right into Tana's presentation if you want to troubleshoot on your side, if that makes sense. Yeah, if you don't mind doing that, that'd be great. Thank you. Cool. Hey, that's no problem. We're going to shuffle it up and we're excited to hear from you, Spencer. Um, and just like that, Tana, we're putting you in the spotlight. Let's hear from our okay. second cohort participant. Right. Thank Ready you so much, up. Spencer. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm just teasing. Where are those 20, 20 year olds when we need them, right? Exactly. Okay. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> getting there, getting there. Perfect. Wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, this is fine. All right, here we go. I'm getting there, getting there. Okay. Um, here we go. Preview. All right, got it. Okay. Here we go. I am Tana Burke. Uh, I'm with Latitude Ventures SkyCycle. We are a wellness tech company with a goal to redefine the airport experience. I'm a global traveler who likes to stay active when I travel, but I'm also a frustrated consumer. So when I travel, I tend to go directly to my departure gate once through security. And once I check the status of my flight, I usually set out for a walk to exercise. Weaving in and out of crowds leaves me more frustrated, only to return to my gate and wait. So in 2019, when I returned from a trip, I began to research, how do you get a workout in the airport? And this is what I found. Who does that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, for most of us, the modern airport experience includes lengthy wait times and an inconvenient mix of queues, leaving passengers both stressed and anxious. San Francisco International Airport's five year strategy states that the greatest frustration for airline passengers is the lack of amenities that appeal to their interest. This is a significant problem for many airports. And I identify with my customers' needs because they mirror my own. Sorry, guys. Uh, so we enhance the moments passengers spend waiting to board their flight. This has been my passion since 2019. We help passengers achieve wellness in the high stress airport environment by connecting passengers to sky cycles so they can energize and unwind. I once heard an airport describe a passenger's experience in this way, and it made a lot of sense to me. Passengers leave their big city to go to the airport, which is a little city. Passengers want the same amenities that they have at home. This is why airports are investing in hospitality with new amenities. A few examples, which you may have seen, include art galleries, spas, places of worship, pet relief, and so on. So this is how we make well-being a part of your travel routine. It's we simply, you can simply connect with the SkyCycle app. Uh, if you use other wellness apps, there's these are screenshots actually from our app that will launch in two weeks. And I know Mark Desette is watching with us from Axiom, and he may be able to shed more light on that, but it's been a great process. So who is our customer? Uh, 
our customers are leisure or business travels. They are on departing or connecting flights or flying international. They already incorporate wellness into their travel routine at home. They may have lifestyles or hobbies that include biking, hiking, walking, team sports, or they may just want to enhance their travel experience with an amenity. It's why we travel to explore. Sorry, one moment. Okay. We have a large business to consumer market. Of our large market, 53% of passengers in the US or 133 million say it's important to exercise while traveling. If only 1% of those who exercise when they travel choose Sky Cycle, our market share is 1.3 million. We have validated interest in Sky Cycle. And these here are some wellness amenities um, that also recognize there is a problem to be solved in this marketplace. But we have a unique solution with Sky Cycle. As I mentioned, we have a two sided marketplace. We spoke about our first customer, which are airline passengers who will ride Sky Cycles, but we also have solutions for airports. Just digging a little deeper into the, this customer, after safety, the number one, the number one goal for, for airports is hospitality for their passengers because that reduces the stress and anxiety around travel. A passenger's visit to the airport is often their first impression of the city. Is it a place they want to live and do business in? For example, I would say Missoula speaks very well for this. We have two revenue streams. One is the sale of Sky Cycles to airport, and the other is our profit per ride, which would be a shared revenue model with airports. Here, is, here are other wellness companies and how we see Sky Cycle fitting into the marketplace. Are you familiar with Palm? They're a meditation and a sleep app, and we all know of Peloton. Um, their focus is mainly on performance. SkyCycle is somewhere in the middle. If you ride your bike to work, grab a walk, or hike at lunch to moderately exercise or maybe close your fitness, fitness rings on your apps, we're here for you. So we have a lot of competitive advantages, but I would like to highlight a couple of them. When airports started moving amenities closer to the departure gates, the spending increased 50%. And the last competitive advantage, this is the self-portrait, is, is really me. Um, why? Because I was chasing a solution to a problem and designing as a consumer. I was sitting at my departure gate and thinking, how could I exercise safely in view of my departure gate and without taking up a lot of space? So here's my team. Steve Dibdahl uh, with Montana Manufacturing. He um, has been very instrumental in connecting me with the engineers to build SkyCycle. And my team of engineers. Um, so can we build it? Yes, we can. Starts with Mark. Um, he is developing the app that will control the sky cycles, um, as well as Stephen Dahl and Lane, the mechanical and the electrical uh, engineers. Um, Mark and I met, actually, he designed the Finn Scooter app uh, for golf, and um, that's how we met through that partnership. So I have to say we're all happy to say and proud to say that we are all from Montana.
So just to highlight again, um, I, I once heard actually, I have to say a definition of an entrepreneur and they described it as learning to do a bunch of new things. Well, if that isn't the truth. So in January, 2019, as I mentioned, this is when my passion and purpose uh, for developing SkyCycle began, um, followed by our first prototype. After 20, after COVID, we went back to work in 2021. And in 2022, we had the team kick off to build the second prototype. So I just want to thank you for your time and supporting all of us entrepreneurs. It's been amazing to work with all of you. And Andrew, you have been amazing too, as well as the guest speakers. So I hope you'll visit me at Ride Sky Cycle to learn more or connect with me. Thank you. Nice, Tana. Well, thank you so much. Latitude Ventures Sky Cycle first up, and it's always hard going first, and you nailed it. So good job. Congratulations. Rajesh and Krishna and the team from Think Deeply, you're up next. Here we go. And we can see your screen, Rajesh. Yeah. Uh, oh, Andrew, thanks for uh, thanks for having this, and then you know, kind of mentoring from the last uh, like last twelve weeks, um, and also thanks for everybody else to take time off your busy afternoons. Um, so we are we are think deeply. You know, our mission is uh, to increase the adoption of AI for SMBs to make the product data management better. Now, it took it took us a while to find the specific problem. Uh, but I'm glad that you know we're working towards it. Um, working towards it. About myself, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm Rajesh Kamaneni. I'm founder of Think Deeply. I'm, I come from with a lot of engineering background. Uh, I led. Uh, I worked at Oracle right now and EdgeNet before that. Um, I um, I had about two decades of experience in building mostly AI powered products. Um, and I love AI, you know, I have educational background in AI and I've been working in AI for about like 10, 20 years. Um, and, you know, if anybody wants to talk about AI, how it works or where to use it, you know, feel free to contact me. Uh, even I kind of encourage my kids uh, to build, uh, to evangelize and build ML and learn, uh, make them learn it. So one of the things that came out was this self-driving RC car I uh, built with my 12, 12 year old. Um, about Think Deeply, you know, we've been around uh, from 2014, building mostly in AI and machine learning products and services. Um, uh, we slowly grew the team. Uh, we, we're about 12 people. Um, mostly all of us are experienced from top tier schools. Um, uh, four of us are in US and about eight in India. Uh, our main expertise is in kind of building machine learning, like we have full stack AI team, um, we worked from building like tracking systems to recommendation systems all over. So we're taking all of those collective experiences that we learned and now we're investing, uh, we're investing into our products and solutions. So uh, to kind of like you know, to introduce the problem, I would suggest like think about like take a step back and imagine you're at a grocery store and you have about you know, 10,000 items that you're selling. Um, and you get the products shipped by suppliers. Along with that, they also send some product data in electronic format, right? Most of the products, they have some sort of a description and metadata, how much they weigh and so on, some pricing and some pictures, right? Uh, pictures or audio, video, anything that goes with it. Now these, uh, now the grocery store, once they get the data, they want to take the data and make it presentable for customers to use it, either from the e-commerce site or the mobile app or wherever that is. Right. Um, so, you know, first step is like kind of knowing what the product is, right? For example, is a tomato fruit or a vegetable? Someone has to categorize them. So that's what the retailers and distributors do. And they take the data, they enrich it, um, and then, you know, they see if the already is there. And if suppliers say, say, increase my price, they need to increase their prices. They have to keep all of this in sync. Now, when the data comes from across multiple suppliers, so same grocery store, which is, which is very likely, Managing of it is very, very stressful, right? You know, it's not like a person is managing it. Uh, so this process is actually done by something called a like product information management. Uh, these tools, you know, they could be homegrown tools, or there could be a commercial vendors that may be supplying it, 
or that could be like you know a couple of spreadsheets you know that people were managing to the, their own spreadsheets right with all of these things uh, uh, when they're managing it there are a lot of issues uh, there are we're seeing a lot of problems in the market right so one is first you know with all the covid and e-commerce you know still growing um, the velocity of updates right whenever a supplier changes their catalog name, description, prices, titles, introduce new products, discontinue new old products. Um, uh, the velocity of the updates was increasing significantly high, right? Um, and then, um, you know, because, you know, this is, you know, even the products exist, the process of updating, it's, uh, the process differs from company to company. It, it's very manual and it's difficult to maintain, right? And the other part also is it's static product content, right? So, if you want to buy a speaker, it doesn't matter whether you are a you know expert or you're a technician or a novice user, you get the same content. So there's no targeted content. Uh, and the commercial providers who are providing these pin systems, they have very limited or very rule-based, very, you know, uh, like very simple rule-based systems to manage it. Right? So this is where this is where we come in. Um, what we are uh, now, this problem of this, it's it's pretty big. Um, it falls under what we call as like a, a data management. Um, so the data management, you know, it's about you know a hundred billion dollar market, um, which you know is is, is going to become about three hundred billion dollars. So we are focusing on a specific segment to provide AI for this PIM market, right? So um, you know it, that's about about six, uh, two to six billion dollar market, and we conservatively put in about ten percent of the global investment. But this is a big problem, right? Uh, the way we are solving it um, is now we're kind of getting nitty gritty details. But at a high level, you know, whenever a product data comes in, it goes through a lot of manual steps. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we are developing models and and technology to uh, to make this process simpler as seamless as possible. So we took all these things and um, we created uh, this, uh, an iceberg, uh, which contains a, um, which uh, automated the entire process um, so that now when a new product data comes in, um, it, it gets to seamlessly gets published and you get a, a, a good product catalog out, right? Now, the way we are doing it also is also very important. It sets us up success. Uh, the way we're executing is um, we're making first self-service so that our customers can create and train their own models themselves. They're not dependent on us. Uh, we have our own version of like a no-code AI platform that the customers can use to build this and manage it, right? We are providing them like an SDKs for integration. So if they want to integrate with their mobile app or if they want to create an Excel plugin, you know, we create all those things, right? Along with it, we're also creating this marketplace where any one-off utilities, uh, we can publish it, or a third-party developer can publish it and have it available for our customers to use. So with, with doing this, our main goal uh, is to kind of, you know, increase the velocity of consumption. So whenever they get product data, it's no longer, it takes, you know, five days to update or five hours to update, it's, it's a matter of seconds, while maintaining the compliance and quality requirements and also kind of providing like a significant cost savings to our customers. Now, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is something that our customers are already using it. Uh, there are two customers that we currently have. Uh, we are working with them and kind of making our product and platform very stable. Uh, one is a, uh, an e-commerce platform company. So they are focused in the distribution industry. They're one of the largest uh, distribution industries uh, product data management provider. Uh, they manage about like almost like 10 to 20 million products. Um, so, and they have like a, a team of 100 plus professionals who are managing their product content. Uh, using our platform and products, they're cutting down things that used to take about, you know, five hours to classify like about like thousand items to like a matter of seconds. Uh, the second company, uh, it's in a similar space. Um, so they're a credential verification company. Um, they get a lot of emails with, uh, uh, from their customers saying that hey, here is my driver's license or here is my insurance certificate, uh, here is my um, EPA certificate. Um, 
um, and they're using like, a BPO process, um, a BPO form to kind of take that incoming documents, digitize them, and then the decision on it so that they can make decisions whether to approve uh, that, uh, that particular customer or not. Uh, what we have taken that uh, business process is similar to the above company. We took the process that takes about 48 hours and convert that into like, you know, a fraction of, you know, it's few seconds they can get, uh, they have it available so they can make a decision on. Right, so our target uh, customers for this um, are mostly like anybody who has product data, um, you know, that includes retailers and distributors. Uh, along with it, you know, if they already pick their own PIMs, uh, we're also uh, we're also trying to work with the PIM vendors directly so that we can integrate uh, we can integrate our APIs and services uh, to them, and they can offer it to their customers. Um, so um, the way uh, so this is we you know we are starting very you know we're at the initial stage. We're currently in the product life cycle management. Uh, in in the next uh, you know next few months we want to kind of get the main our MVP done um, MVP including like all the models and things that we want to finish and then start targeting more go after the global pin markets and then eventually enter the data management market. Um, so we are uh, looking to raise money. Uh, we are ready for a pre-series A round. So we have a technology in place, uh, team in place. Um, and mostly like we want, we're trying to raise money to kind of go to the next step, right? You know, kind of finish our existing commitments and start investing heavily into sales and marketing to acquire new customers. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, depending upon the time, uh, let me check. Um, I think um, I can also, uh, uh, I have a brief demo. Uh, if maybe after everybody's is done, I can kind of show you how, how we do things. Uh, how, how does the marketplace looks like? How do we generate product content? How does a customer can do self-service of uh, models and solutions themselves? Uh, that's all I have. Um, thank you, Rajesh. That was awesome. And like you said, after the presentation today, we do have some time to go deeper. If we have time, if anyone wants to stick around, we can definitely stick around and do a product demo of that back end to show how it works. So that's great. Thank you so much. And really excited to have you as a participant. And I think Molly Bradford last cohort uh, called, we coined it the restartup, right? You've been around for a while, but you're recentered and refocused. So really excited to have you and appreciate that presentation. That was great. Ashley, and you're up next. You ready to go? I think you're muted, but you will be unmuted momentarily. That's for sure. There we go. <laughs> Rock and roll. Hi, everybody. I am Ashleen. I'm going to show you here what's going. All right. And I'm with Hometown DIY. We are here in Missoula, Montana, but we're going to be heading elsewhere down the road. A little bit about who I am. I am a Missoulian born and raised. I've spent most of my career as a 911 dispatcher. And it was through that process that I really found my passion for creating and creativity and the power that that holds and the, the power that creativity in itself and what it can do for people's lives. And that passion did end up getting me cast on a reality TV show for entrepreneurs, which was a pretty amazing experience. I might not be a reality star, but I definitely got my message out internationally, which is pretty incredible. So what is that message? My message is that anyone can create. We just have to put the right tools in the right people's hands. And that all it takes is a little bit of encouragement and the resources to create your projects for most people to be successful in that. And beyond that, I really am true to my mission in helping people heal and helping people process things in their life through creativity. At Hometown DIY, we're able to accomplish that by giving people the space and the tools and the supplies to create their projects. We provide them with the education and safety training to do that in a way that keeps them safe and keeps them thriving. And we do it through community and through encouragement. We're able to keep people excited about coming back every day because they can learn new things, they can explore new things, and they can make new connections. Because this is a real problem for people. People don't have the space. It's expensive to get started, especially if you're interested in multiple crafts and hobbies. 
and you don't know where to start a lot of the time. And I know this personally because this was my story. Just this last weekend, I came across a message on Facebook that I had posted about stubbing my toe on an anvil in my bathroom because we used to create and craft in every nook and cranny of our home. And that made me to go look through some of my other posts about what I was doing. I've painted in my bed. We built this puppet theater right in the middle of our living room one time. We needed space. We had the th the desire to create and we just had nowhere to do that. So that led me to realize that I'm not the only one, especially as millennials. And I've identified this person, we're gonna call him Millennial Max. We are a very principled spending group. We believe in causes and missions and we're willing to throw extra money at things that we give and get behind and that we believe in. We are seeking ways to balance our lives. We're not gonna work to live we're going to live, I mean, sorry, we're not going to live to work, we're going to work to live. We are all about making sure that we're able to afford the things that we need to, but life isn't about the grind. And we're really big on community, whether that's in person or on social media, we like connecting with people, we like expressing our views and having our voices heard and our, our peers as part of that group. So our target markets primarily are going to be that millennial creative space because the millennials are seeking creative outlets and they're the ones who are making up the largest market market share of crafters and creatives in the country. 41% of crafters in the country are millennials. And of that 41%, most of them participate in five or more crafts at a time, which is expensive to get started with if you have to have the supplies and the tools for those five different mediums. And then going back from that, most also participate in two to four. So we're really gonna focus in on those multiple talent, multi-talented millennial crafters. And in the Missoula area where we're getting started, that really looks like a 14,000-ish person market. If we only have a small slice of that, we're gonna have a very thriving community. In Missoula, there are a lot of artistic outlets. We've got a lot of places that are really great. We've got a lot of DIY places. We've got a lot of art places, but they're all different from who we are and what we are. We are the place where you're able to be a member of a community. We have a range of products. You can access us anytime you need to. You don't have to end up have an appointment. You don't have to wait for a class and you can come in with with yourself or with a friend and create whatever projects you want. You're not stuck with what's on the agenda for the day which is a pretty cool differentiation. And so where are we at now? We're currently pre-seed fundraising and we're trying to get some more funds put together so that we can get our space and we can build it out and we can hire the rest of our team. We're also trying to find a good location in Missoula. It's pretty tough to be centrally located and have that mixed use type space that we need. And we're always looking for mentorship and collaboration and I think I actually may have skipped some slides in there. I'm not sure how, but if anybody has any questions, uh, I would love to connect with people more and share with you guys more about what we are and what we do. Awesome. Thank you, Ashleen. Thank you. Sometime DIY, that's great. Really appreciate it. And there's, you'll have to check out the blocks. It just debuted the, the TV show you're on. When did it debut? Mm -hmm. It just recently did, right? On what channel? In October, yeah. And it, you can actually watch our season on Facebook, on the Beta Blocks um, page on Facebook, or they have an app called The Blocks for both Apple and Android. And our season actually led to them getting picked up by a major streamer. So coming soon, there'll be additional seasons on a major platform, which is pretty cool. That is cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. and. Looking forward to crafting in Missoula and building things and being part of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right, up next we have Hans Hoffman. Hans, are you ready to go? Ready. All right, rock and roll. Ashley will stop her share and you can take over, take the reins. I'm trying, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. It's not wanting to stop. I got this. I can help. Perfect. Okay, go ahead, Hans. All right, you guys uh, see my screen now? My yeah, it's a little matters? zoomed in. Just a little zoomed in for some reason. There you go. A little zoomed in. What does that mean? 
the, your perfect. screen. This is perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I'd like to talk to you about Boundless Home. It's a real estate search app without limits. A little about me. I've been a project manager for over 13 years. Uh, I'm a certified project manager. I got my PMP. And that's work I mostly do remotely, most recently for Jupiter Entertainment in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I also have a real estate license, which I use mostly to run my own transactions. So I first noticed the issue when I was searching for a property. I was thinking something on the Oregon coast because that's easy to get to from here. Something with a golf course nearby or a beach or a marina, you know, stuff to attract short-term rentals when I'm not using it. So I went to each of the four major search sites, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, and Realtor.com, and I noticed they all had one thing in common. They all started with a specific place. I did not have a specific place in mind. I had a kind of a place, and I realized that we're missing something here. The way that I wanted to search doesn't exist. I looked and looked. So the old model doesn't work for a big part of the population, and that's because of the rise of remote work, the increasing number and decreasing age of retirees, and the explosion of the short-term rental market. More people who are searching for property are not tied to a specific place. There are 24 million remote workers in the U.S. That's fully remote, people who never go to an office there are more than 49 million retirees. Half the U.S. population over the age of 55 consider themselves retired. And there are more than 7 million vacation or second homes in the U.S. And more than a million of those are on the short-term rental sites. So if you're not tied to a specific place, the first question is not where do you want to live, but how do you want to live? Do you want to be near your hobbies, or is travel important to you, proximity to international airports, or maybe attractions or sporting events, or nightlife, or quality of medical care? It, 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 it could be hundreds of different things, and it's different for everyone depending on their goals. So here's how the app works. Boundless Home is a two-sided marketplace, agents and real estate buyers. The agents create two data sets. They create their own profiles, their business profiles, and they also create location profiles. And that's everything from the state, the city, neighborhoods, HOAs. It's, it's the areas they serve and they know well. I also include publicly or commercially available geodata. And then buyers create their own profiles where they define what they want. My algorithm uses the buyer profiles and my data sets to curate locations for that buyer. Then using the property database, otherwise known as the MLS, my algorithm scores and ranks properties from across all the matching locations as they relate to that specific buyer's profile. The buyer picks a property and I connect them with an agent. When that agent closes the deal, I collect 25% of that agent's commission. That's an industry standard 25% referral fee. And then I track the agent's performance. When I talked to buyers from each of those groups, it, they all had different frustrations, but the main common ones were that market research is hard. It takes a lot of time to dig into one location, let alone dozens. At Boundless Home, buyers define their needs one time. And data is hard to find. The news articles just use little snippets of it. I have a unique agent-created data set and the best available geodata, and I make it available for my users. And when purchasing, purchasing a property remotely, the buyers need help, and they don't know who to trust. Agents on Boundless Home are properly motivated because I track their record and they have demonstrated knowledge and expertise. Agents have their own pains. And I'm going to talk about Zillow here because they're the biggest player in this, in this industry. They're high upfront costs. In the Zillow model, 
agents buy a percentage of a zip code and then they receive that portion of the leads that come in on that zip code. There's no guarantee they ever get any leads. And those zip codes are expensive. At Boundless Home, agents don't pay up front. Their initial outlay is sweat equity. The pricing of those zip codes changes quarterly at Zillow and it's always up and there's no explanation. I'm really transparent, 25% industry standard referral fee. Boundless Home does some things to trick buyers into becoming leads. They'll pop up a button that says something like, tell me more. And the buyer clicks on it and then they're introduced to an agent who's never been to the property. Meanwhile, Zillow calls that buyer a lead and that agent just paid 800 bucks for it. Whoever, in my, in my model, agents are gonna know the buyer's level of interest. I'm gonna have the buyer disclose that if they're just kicking tires or if they're ready to go. And I'll let my agents know that and they can decide if they take the call. They didn't pay anything up front anyway. Uh, whoever pays the most gets the most leads on Zillow. At Boundless Home, it's a meritocracy. The agents who contribute the most and demonstrate the most knowledge, they get the, the most leads. And I keep track of their track record. So I help buyers save time and effort by giving them access to data and tools to use it to identify locations and properties that meet their goals. And then I introduce them to trusted boots on the ground. And I help agents who want to grow their business to stand out by giving them a platform and rewarding their knowledge and expertise and their performance. And then I treat them fairly. If you want to know about, more about bound, Boundless Home, you can go to searchonbound.com. If you want to know more about me, you can go to my LinkedIn page. Great job, Hans. That was super fun. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Found the sum, just like that. And just like that, we're back to the beginning with Spencer Bradford as well, telling us all about his opportunity. Let's do it, Spencer. All right. Is uh, you guys, I'm hoping that you're seeing it. Roger that. Yeah. There's nothing better than uh, doing security updates and then not breaking everything. So I appreciate everybody's. Uh, Patience here. So uh, I'm going to tell you about um, a really unique way to check a bunch of boxes in people, planet, and profit with a uniquely Montana um, product that I'm going to bring to market. Fishhawk Sustainable Industries uh, began in a uh, hearing about the most amazing business I've ever heard of. And I'm gonna share that story a little later, but the fisheries business has some big problems. Okay, and those problems. Well, dad, apparently I don't get to. Hey, just a sec, I'm in the middle of something. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, those problems, I'm sure everybody's heard about. Um, those are, collapsing snow crab fisheries, that's 46% uh, of seafood on high-end restaurants is not DNA matched to what's on the menu. Um, these problems are ghost fishing fleets that sit right outside um, countries, exclusive economic zones that can't police their own waters and just rapaciously take the resource out of uh, the mouths and the money out of people that really, they, they need it. Um, so in Montana, we're really well aware that, you know, uh, fish habitat is everything. Um, it, it's a huge part of our economy um, and non-native fish and invasive species hurt that because they compete for resources. Um, we all know that customers, the wellness thing is huge and people want to be able to eat healthy, sustainable protein, and we need good jobs and clean water in the West. If people ate fish or ate meat one time less a month, we could solve the problem of the water crisis in the West. 
So I'm going to tell a little story here, and this is starts in the 1980s at the New England Aquarium. My mom took a course on how to cook monkfish. Um, well, it was considered a trash fish. And the reason that the New England Aquarium was offering this course was because George's Bank had collapsed, which is a cod fishing fishery off of the coast of Newfoundland. And uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, the economy collapsed. There are towns in Alaska right now that are suffering mightily because of um, fishery population collapse. Um, there are seasons that have been shut down all the way from up and down the West Coast from California all the way up into Alaska where fish stocks are just collapsing. Um, so I've seen what um, problems with fisheries could do to towns. Um, my background, is I'm from the East Coast. I had my first job in this restaurant, which was sometimes a little too close to the water than it should have been. This was the Barnacle. I was a dishwasher at age 12. Um, I moved to the Pacific Northwest and studied fisheries as soon as I could get out of the East Coast, uh, mainly to chase mountains and rivers as well. And I studied the um, sustainable yield of the Pacific Hake fishery in Argentina at the Evergreen State College in the very early 90s. Um, it rains a ton out there and is really unpleasant living. I ended up in Montana just about 30 years ago. And uh, in that time, I've been a television producer director. Um, I've been the brand experience manager and product line coordinator for Big Sky Brewing. Spent the last 10 years um, working for a privately funded biological research station. Uh, and my last uh, job was in doing quality assurance, quality control for cybersecurity. So I've got a pretty diverse background, um, but throughout it, sustainability and um, being outdoors and trying to be close to the, uh, the planet has always been a big part of it. So what kind of solutions can we do here in Western Montana? Well, I got some great news. There are two major things. There's already a model that's being used and it's being used in Bristol Bay, Alaska. Um, they have an excellent managed fishery that's known the world over. And the other thing that's super exciting is the blue economy. And if you haven't heard about the blue economy, um, Guess what? I hadn't either till somewhat recently. But this is super interesting. This says to this has some of the biggest players in the world behind it. The UN, UNESCO, the World Bank, G7, G20, like pretty much anybody who's anybody realizes that the planet could be in really big trouble if this huge source of protein of ocean fisheries um, has more problems. So what can we all do about that? We can eat further down the food chain. Anybody know what kind of fish this is? I know nobody really has, everybody's muted, but this is a lake trout out of um, Flathead Lake. Uh, looks a lot like a salmon. The reason that I would love to go fish for this fish if it was good to put on people's plates. Problem with this fish is it's an apex predator. It's full of um, forever chemicals, mercury and PCBs. The higher you go up in the food chain, the higher these toxins accumulate. So the blue economy is a really interesting idea where you try and create sustainable business models that take in a ton of factors, equity, biodiversity, infrastructure. Um, and when you have those enabling conditions, you can do some pretty amazing things. Um, Icelandic cod is a really good example. Um, but another one that is the Alaskan fishery of, of Bristol Bay. So this is pretty much who I'm not, I don't want to say I want to, I'm competing with, but this is who I'm, I want to, I want to go, I want to mimic. I want to, they're leading the way. 
And this is how the first project, this is the guy I want to introduce you to. This is Lake Whitefish. Lake Whitefish is the um, biggest commercial fishery, inland fishery in Canada. Um, it's also a huge part of the region's history. In the Salish language um, dictionaries I've been able to find, the inland Salish only have four words for fish and one's just general fish, one's bull trout, one's whitefish, and one's salmon. And this is the word for whitefish. So, all this text on the screen, you can read it if you want. Essentially it's saying this fish is super important and it's a part of the salmon family. A lot of fly fishermen out there get sucker fish confused with whitefish. We're not talking about eating sucker fish. We're talking about whitefish. It's a salmon, it's a whitefish. Um, so in terms of wellness, it's an amazing species. And since it's lower on the food chain, it has a ton less of the stuff you don't want in your fish. This October, Iceland and governors of the Great Lakes introduced the 100% whitefish initiative. Um, and it was pretty wild to hear about this when I was back in the Midwest at this time. Um, what Iceland's, Iceland's been able to do with their cod is that they've taken the value of their catch from each fish being worth $12 just for the fillets. And I have a real hard time believing this, but they're maintaining that th they're getting $3,500 of value per fish in the... So I'm skeptical of that. But what the general idea is that this white fish has amazing roe. It has caviar grade roe. It has delicious, it's delicious smoked and preserved. The fillets are amazing. And there's a third product that I think I can bring to market in a later phase of this, but initially I'm looking at adding value to the whitefish catch. There's about estimated five to 15,000 or five to 15 million whitefish in Flathead Lake in the Flathead River. And that's where we're talking about um, pulling these guys out of. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, does a best choice seafood um, ranking. And this is uh, super important to consumers, uh, certain consumers. They really don't want to be part of the problem. And they don't want to, there's a terrible, um, this American life about what potential calamari can be. If you want to look it up, I hope you don't vomit. But um, the tr truth in labeling and seafood is a problem. So the difference between best choices and the ones to avoid all have to do with the fishing method. So for my minimum viable product, I'm going to do tread a path that's been tread before. And I'm going to explain that in just a second. But eventually, this is a method that's being used in the Midwest called trap netting that has zero bycatch. And that is the clutch thing for making sustainable fisheries. Is the fish come up alive and they come up, you can throw back the ones you don't want. So this brings us to the story of Ron Moan up in the Flathead. And uh, in the 90s, he moved here to retire after being a physician's assistant. He was originally from here. Um, and he put it, took out an ad in the Flathead Beacon. And he said, hey, you know, I really love to fish for whitefish. 
thinking about selling fillets to local restaurants. Uh, anybody want to come by point X and drop your fish off with me? I'll, I'll give you some beer or give you a little bit of money. And he got so many replies and he had people asking him if they could pay that him for him to sell his mm -hmm. fish. Um, the fish he had was better than the fish uh, out of the Midwest because it was coming out of the, the water during a cold time of year. It has less of a fishy flavor. And uh, the crown on the continent produces amazing, clear, clean water. So this is a top notch product. And this is why this is the first project I wanna start with. So what could I improve upon with Ray Moan's business? Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack in um, 20, 2009. And um, his business did not continue. It probably did not continue because you need to fish from October 15th through Christmas. Um, and one of my real big competitive advantages is that sounds wonderful to me. Um, so the improvements we can do is I can, as opposed to just retirees um, up in the flathead, I know guides, I know trail crew workers, I know tree planters, I know ski bums, people that are interested in getting a shot in the arm of money between October and December. Uh, processing has come a long way since uh, Mountain Lakes Fisheries was doing it. There's um, automated, a lot of automation that's happened and uh, the ability to glaze fish uh, with a super thin layer of ice to keep it fresh um, better. Um, Ray didn't really do anything with smoking or doing spreads or um, he did sell the row and the row ended up taking over what he was getting for his fillets. And this is a good old boy who all of a sudden found himself in the caviar business and getting calls from shady Russian guys. So there's a really funny story in the Flathead Beacon about it. Uh, it's just classic. Um, I fully understand the, um, the value of place, story, marketing. We got something beautiful and amazing here in Montana. And uh, I hope to collaborate with, uh, you know, some people. I'm thinking winter uh, glacier country whitefish could be something that could be on a, um, in a fish counter. Um, right now we're at a really unique geopolitical moment and caviar from Russia might not be so hot moving forward. Um, I also have a secret weapon in my daughter, Elizabeth, who I think is a fish whisperer. Mm -hmm. um, the market, you know, the total addressable market is, uh, I think it's 10 billion. That's the number of people in the United States who eat uh, fish once a week. Um, you know, my serviceable addressable market to start off is pretty much, uh, to keep, keep it fresh and keep the product, um, grade A and top notch is then about a three to four hour circle of, um, where the product's being produced. Uh, but then moving into, uh, the Midwest and, uh, the Pacific Northwest, I think that there's huge potential for this product. Uh, the number of fish and even just the row and with them smoked, it's there's $1 billion worth of resource sitting in Flathead Lake and Flathead, the Flathead River. Uh, this is who those people could be. Um, you know, it's a great demographic. It's what you want in a demographic, but I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about equity. Um, 
this is a traditional fish. This is, this fish was smoked and traveled with the Salish to the buffalo hunting grounds. So uh, tribes would know about this fish um, and look forward to it, other tribes. That... So um, another quick little story. The first Thanksgiving, they probably had lobster. Lobster was a food for poor people and uh, Native Americans in the colonies. It was not for rich people. Um, I'm committed that if this, if I can get this off the ground, this protein won't just end up in shishi restaurants in Seattle. It'll end up on the Crow Reservation. It'll end up on on Rocky Boy, and that's something that financially I think is important because this is a this is a resource that um, has traditionally been super important to the Salish, and I don't want to continue the uh, the trend of how things have worked out for them. Phases, um, phase X and phase Z. This is the end of phase Z. It's been, been an amazing phase. I've learned more about this in the last 12 weeks than I did almost in the last 12 years. Um, it really, um, you know, I'm just super grateful for all the help. Uh, phase A, Q1, Q2, I want to do some more um, financial modeling. Mainly this, this winter with uh, ice up happening on the river made me realize that uh, I might need to do modeling more on an ag agricultural model where some years you just don't get the harvest that you want. Um, but conservative, that's written into, you know, conservative modeling. Um, with maximum sustainable yield and optimum sustainable yield is a big part of what this, the roadmap that I'm building with this, pro, this product is. And the goal is to take that roadmap and potentially take it to other products if it's successful. Uh, phase B, quarter three and four, um, recipe development, getting the product to some fine dining establishments, continue to reach out to the tribe and local marketing people. Phase C, with if there's a success, if I have a successful fishing season, um, I will ramp up a modern processing facility around um, Columbia Falls, Creston, and uh, shoot for 20,000 pounds of finished fillets and 75 pounds a row. And if I can get the trap nets accepted, they have days in the Midwest using those trap nets where they're pulling in 10,000 pounds of fish a day. So to successfully, the reason that it helps native species by taking this fish out of the environment, and that's technically called extirpating. Uh, it's a good Scrabble word, I think. Um, is that all the fish, when they're fry, eat the same stuff. They eat these small little microorganisms. And when you have too many of one species, it hurts the bull trout. It hurts the cutthroat trout. It hurts those iconic Montana species. And I want to have a third um, viable product. I don't know what it is, but you guys just got a big hint. Um, it's essentially to get collagen out of the skin and the bones, it's a chemistry equation. So, just wanted to say thanks for everybody um, putting up with my stumbling through my failed launch at the beginning of this, but also my family and Blackfoot, my community. Andrew, great to work with you. And uh, you can reach me. At, I'm super easy to get in touch with. Just Spencer Bradford at Gmail.
Well, Spencer, thank you for that. And, you know, late start, good finish. That's what it's all about, my man. And I love the Prezi presentation. That was really good. Um, and everyone, thank you so much for joining the C2M Showcase event. I'm going to steal the screen share for my final slide here where, first of all, thanks everyone for attending, right? As Spencer said, you can reach out to each of these cohort participants directly if you want to reach out to them. You can also reach out to me and I can get you all their information. Additionally, if you're interested in joining the spring cohort starting in April, reach out, go to our website, fill out the form. If you want to chat, again, on that website, reach out and chat with us. And then as Eric said at the beginning of the talk, check out that small business toolkit, right? Because it's an incredible asset that hopefully can help other small businesses grow, not just early stage entrepreneurs. So from everyone at Blackfoot, from all of our C2M cohort participants, past, present, and even into the future, I hope everyone has an awesome holiday. And we'll see you back here in a number of short weeks for the spring cohort showcase event, hopefully live in either Bozeman or Missoula coming soon. So we'll keep everyone updated for that as well. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great Tuesday. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrew.